Hello and welcome to Let's Do the Science, the show that comments on depictions of science and technology in media news. This week, we're going to talk about the latest episode of the sci-fi series, The Expanse. Now, I highly recommend this series, not just for sci-fi fans out there, but for fans of good quality character-driven drama everywhere. In my opinion, it's one of the best shows on TV right now, and although it's fundamentally about people and politics, the science has given so much thought in the show that it's almost a character by itself. Be careful for minor spoilers about the episode if you haven't seen it, but the intention is to talk about the depiction of science in the show, so enough of that. Without further ado, let's do the science on The Expanse, Season 2, Episode 7. So when the show opens, you're immediately hit with a shot of a crystal of blood floating in, well, I won't say the atmosphere, but floating above a character who's been wounded. And it brought the question to mind, does blood freeze in a vacuum? And the reason for that question is there are really two competing scientific principles at stake here. The first is that at very low pressures, liquids tend to boil easier. So they, uh, at, in a vacuum, water will boil away almost completely. And blood is about 92% water, but it's a mixture of other things like plasma and cells and other biomatter. So the other competing bit about that is what is thermal radiation in space? And we know that in space, actually things cool off much slower than we would anticipate. Movies are famous for sort of giving the impression that as soon as you're exposed to the vacuum, you freeze instantly, but that's actually not accurate. In space, you do radiate thermal energy through uh, infrared radiation, but there's no way to transfer your heat to some other media like you would in air or water, where the heat from your body might go out into the air temperature or in water, you lose heat 20 times faster because the thermal Thermal conductivity of water is 20 times higher than it is in air. In space, you don't have any of those factors. So it seems that it's a bit of a question as to whether blood would boil or away or would it freeze before it gets a chance to boil. Now, there's been some debate on this on physics forums and a few papers written on it, but we know that, again, Thermal radiation is very slow to dissipate in a vacuum because there's nothing to transfer the energy to. And people have done some sort of basic calculations to, to try to figure out what would it take for the human body to completely freeze in a vacuum. And some of the early ca calculations are somewhere around 18 hours or so, although that's not exact because it depends on a lot of factors like whether there's sunlight or whether there's another heat source or whether it's close to the body and a lot of things like that. So it's up in the air, but I first want to say it's definitely feasible, but it's questionable. Uh, there's a lot of videos around bo liquids both boiling and freezing in a vacuum at the same time, which is really incredible to watch. I suggest you go out on YouTube and watch a few of those video videos. They're very interesting. I think what would probably happen is uh, if the droplets of blood coming out, because uh, if you're watching the show, there's a sort of a, stream, a spray of blood coming out from the uh, suits of these wounded Marines that are on the moon of Ganymede, a moon of Jupiter. I'll talk about that more in a future episode. But essentially what's going on is it's spraying into fine droplets. And the question is, would these small, tiny droplets radiate enough heat that they would, that they would freeze before they evaporated or, or they evaporate first? I think it's likely you're going to get a little bit of both. The very, very fine little particles, they're going to freeze into these crystals and they might even adhere because of static electricity more than gravity to the people around them or the land around it. And you're going to get a, uh, a lot of that blood is going to boil away immediately into gas and you're going to get some residue left on the armor. So I think it's very likely and this is a great, very good catch by the showrunners on this. The next shot shows that character receiving an injection through their bodysuit, something that modern spacesuits cannot do. You can't puncture a spacesuit in the vacuum of space. The, the in person inside would die, obviously. So somehow in the future, these spacesuits have a metamaterial or something that allows them to self-seal. That would be an incredibly important technolo technological development for future spacesuits. People need to live and work out in space, and that would absolutely be necessary for people to survive out there quick shot of a smartphone of the future. It's made of some sort of crystal or polymer material that's transparent. So transparent electronics seem to be very integrated into the future. Also by the placement of thumbs on either side of the device, you can sort of see that it has some sort of holographic or image projection out into the air on the side. Very interesting feature that could be uh, easily imaginable in the future. 
Another thing I sort of love about this shot is you can see in the upper left hand corner, battery life is still a problem in the future uh, and it's about halfway charged, although hopefully batteries last a little bit longer than they do today. Another quick shot of a Martian warship in space. Now something to note is the shape of the ship itself, that boxy shape that's sort of hexagonal. That's a, there's a reason behind that. They've established that direct fire weapons are a, very much a part of future warfare. And again, I hope we never find that out. But if we do, field of fire and sort of fire arc on these weapons are going to be extremely important. The shape of that ship allows two sides of the ship to be able to hit any direction at once which would be incredibly important many studies have shown that sort of an egg shape or a hexagonal shape would be highly efficient for getting weapons on target in space and highly important to future warfare Here's a shot of a belter with a burn scar around his neck this is a common injury for people who work long hours in space the, the suits, the EVA suits that they use tend to heat up and they are prone to scarring and burning the necks of the people in them. As due to several factors, probably there's some social issues around sort of low cost equipment and poor quality equipment, also wear, wear and tear and equipment. But a really big problem with space exposure is buildup of heat. I mentioned earlier that radiating heat, that freezing is a slow process because there's nothing to transfer the heat to. You just have to radiate it out through, uh, through thermal uh, infrared radiation heat buildup is a very real problem in space however because with nothing to radiate the heat out to it just builds up in whatever material is receiving it so incoming sunlight even the body temperature of a person inside the suit would build up over time and cooling astronauts is a very big problem with nasa right now it would continue to be a problem in the future and you would get people injured and very severely in some cases because they wouldn't be able to exit the suit so heat buildup will be a very real problem for anyone living and working in space Later on in the episode, we see an interrogation scene where the interrogator takes a pill to heighten their senses and their focus to serve as a sort of human lie detector. They can detect the facial expression changes, they can detect changes in the hand motion, and they can determine if the person is lying. The implications are that humans are still much better at this than AI or computers in the future. There's a small beat here that I really love between these two characters laughing about the realities of living in space and they're talking about being constipated, which would be a bit of a danger in the future. You're in low gravity, you're in low pressure environments, you're likely to have tissue swelling and some other issues. So people would have to suffer with those small minor inconveniences quite often. There's a scene later during recall of some Martians moving across the surface of the planet Ganymede that I originally thought they got wrong, but actually they got very right and I was impressed with the research there. Ganymede is the ninth largest object in the known solar system. And I say known actually because we have early indicators that there is what they call Planet Nine quite a ways out there past the Kuiper Belt that is 10 times the mass of the Earth. And we haven't observed it yet, but we have some direct evidence of that through the gravitational movements of objects in the outer part of the solar system. So if we ever find that, uh, it will demote Ganymede to the 10th largest object in the solar system. But for now, it sits firmly at the ninth. It lacks density. So while it's bigger than Mercury, it has much less uh, gravity and it actually has less gravity than the moon itself. So when I first saw this scene and the Marines running across the surface, I thought, well, they should be sort of bouncing like we see astronauts in footage of the moonwalk. But further research shows that they actually got it right in the show. The bouncing motion that we're used to seeing from footage of astronauts on the moon is really about them specifically doing bunny hops because it's a little bit easier to move in that light gravity because it's hard to balance yourself without the weight of your full body. But also it's really due to the restriction of the suits themselves. They couldn't move their foot out in front of them very well. So hopping was a much easier thing to do and much better for them in that suit. But in the future, we know that the, these Marines have tight body suits that really allow them a wide range of motion and for military use in the future again i hope we never have to find out but the ability to sort of stay on the surface and control which direction you're moving would be highly important in combat it would be very vulnerable to bounce and get high into the air you get shot by the enemy you'd be a target and you wouldn't be a very practical type of movement for combat so staying close to the surface you probably have to take a lot of training moving quickly across the surface as you can that would be very important but the motion that they have where it's kind of slightly slow motion but mostly not bouncing that's very very accurate for what you see and you can see some footage on, of astronauts on the moon where they're walking normally and not having to bounce next up we have some marines out who have lost communications with one another they've been jammed 
Obviously, there's no way to communicate in the vacuum of space, so putting their helmets together, they're able to let the vibrations of their voice transfer between the helmets and able to hear each other. Some reports of deep sea divers being able to do this would be very useful in the future as a survival technique. A great shot of the surface of Ganymede. Ganymede's composition is about 50-50 silica rock and water ice. So it would be very shiny, very high albedo, uh, but also be very dirty. So sort of the dirty snowball that we sort of think about uh, about comets with a little bit more rock involved. Here's a shot of a holographic heads-up display used in the future. And I was actually laughing a little bit because uh, similar to the VR headsets of today, it's still quite bulky and similar to sets, to sets of today, it also has a large wire that has to come out the back and still attach people to the back. So it looks like at least in, the in this future, that technology has not advanced, at least on the connectivity. Certainly the display is very advanced though because it is a holographic display. Here's a shot of a ship leaving Tycho Station. Now that ring you see below it is constantly rotating, so it is providing gravity to the people inside, but that also means that ships attached to it, when they release, should fall away from the structure at about the speed of, let's say, dropping a cup off of a building. It's possible that the ship is providing some thrust from its cone. I don't see any there, and I don't see any thrusters firing. That doesn't mean it can't, but for the most part, we would expect ships to drop away at about uh, 9.8 meters per second assuming that uh, there's one gravity at that uh, stage of the ring and we would expect it to fall away quickly and not sort of hover above it like it does. Another interesting event in the series is another ship undocks. It quickly turns around and sort of shoots off, chasing after another ship. And I wondered that the ship turned very quickly, and I think that's necessary for narrative of the story. So this is not a complaint. No one wants to see a slow turning ship. But I wanted to kind of figure out what would the force be on the inhabitants of the ship, especially on the bridge. So some quick math here. The calculation necessary to figure out the g-force from a centrifuge is the constant 1.12 times 10 to the negative fifth times the number of rpm squared times the number of centimeters so taking that equation i wanted to apply it to some numbers for the rosinante here some very industrious fans did some calculations on the ship. They estimated, I think, a length of the Rosinante about 57 meters. And if you knocked off, let's say, generously 17 meters for the cone and some of the instrumentation up front and approximate the crew size, that puts it about a, a habitable zone of about 40 meters, let's say. So based on the, if the spin is at the center point of that, of the ship, we'll say that the radius is about 20 meters from the spin point of the ship up to where the crew is sitting in the bridge. So plugging those numbers into this calculation really quickly, we get about 30. I'm estimating that there's a, the, it turns 180 degrees or so in about one second, I'm guessing that, uh, and 20 meters is converged to about 2000 centimeters. So given that calculation, that results in a G-force of about 20 Gs, and that's in the outward direction uh, for this spin there. So they would be thrown towards the ceiling at about 20 Gs. That's pretty hefty. Uh, that is not what they're experiencing in the show, but it's no problem. It's for narrative purposes, and it's not a complaint at all. It's still wonderful. Um, incidentally, though, humans would be able to survive for a short period of time, that 20 Gs, uh, especially if they were prone. Now, they would be thrown against the straps as the Rosinante is configured in the show. Um, in the book, they have these sort of gimbaled acceleration couches that would handle that much better but um, obviously I don't think you see that and that's not what we're dealing with but just if you were to understand that we're in the real world that those people would experience about 20 G's and I'd love for somebody to check my calculations on that that's a rough estimate by the way but I think it's it's quite considerable um, for show purposes you don't want to see that no one wants to see the ship on dock and take a minute to turn around and go after the, the, the people it has to do in a tense situation that's totally untenable for a show so completely excusable but it, I thought it was interesting to calculate the actual numbers uh, in play there all right, so that's as much fun as I can have this week. That is it for Let's Do the Science for The Expanse Season 2, Episode 7. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, go ahead and leave a like or subscribe to this channel for future videos. I'll be putting out about one a week around on Monday. So thank you much, so much for, for viewing. I hope you'll subscribe. If you have a comment, I hope you'll leave it in the comment section for this video. If you like the video, go ahead and leave a like. That really helps me a lot. 
in terms of understanding what the content of the show and how that should be and how that appeals to the audience. So this is my premiere episode. Thank you so much for dropping by. I appreciate you taking the time to view to the end. If you've gotten all the way to the end of this video, go ahead and leave the hashtag uh, The Expanse in the comments and I'll know you got to, this, to the end of this video. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching and I will see you next week.